This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by my stupendous, awesome, legendary supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support Shadowversity on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash Shadowversity. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and a new medieval movie has caught my eye, entitled The Outlaw King, which is going to be released by Netflix. And so in this video, we're going to be analysing the trailer to see how accurate it is. Now, The Outlaw King is supposed to be a cinematic presentation of the life, or at least the latter part of the life, of Robert the Bruce, the man who became the Scottish King and fought off the English. And if that name is sounding familiar, yes, he does technically appear in Braveheart, but you should not look to Braveheart for historical accuracy. Seriously, just look at this image. Nearly everything he's wearing or holding is either anachronistic or fantasy. That studded leather armor and bracer, fantasy. That kilt, wrong period. That sword, wrong period. It's all wrong! Should we look to this movie for historical accuracy? Probably not. Hollywood always dramatizes everything and to make it more cohesive as a story than what the actual historical events and facts were. But yes, Robert the Bruce was a part of William Wallace's rebellion, though this movie looks to be based after the time of William Wallace. Not long after the time, this is entitled The Outlaw King, so we can kind of figure out that this is when Robert the Bruce was defeated by the English, and he fled into exile for a year and then came back and started to wage a fairly impressive guerrilla war that lasted around 10 years for the main fighting but didn't complete until they captured the final English stronghold at Berwick in 1318, which was 11 years from the time he returned from his exile in 1307 and reclaimed all Scottish lands, though technically war was still between the Scots and the English until Edward II died and Edward III took the throne and negotiated peace with the Treaty of Edinburgh, Northampton in 1320. And so this is the opening shot of the movie, and the first thing that kind of stood out to me was the fact that, hey, they look to be wearing gambesons. Now, are these combat-type gambesons? They look to be a, a little bit on the thinner side, but they probably could deflect some incoming attacks. But we shouldn't think that this is the main fashion of this time. Just one decent example of the type of clothing that we would expect to see within this period, which is really the very beginning of the 14th century, the 1300s. So it'll be interesting to pay attention to how much colour is present throughout this trailer. But still, Gambesons, and it seems like Hollywood are finally starting to catch on that Gambesons were decently prominent and was effective armour and they're not spewing fantasy leather bullcrap everywhere. Talking about fantasy leather armour, and Gambesons were more prominent so it's great that we see them in movies depicting the medieval period. Okay, first shot of the armour that we're going to be seeing in this movie and you know, it doesn't look too bad. The 14th century was kind of the age of experimentation with armour, and so at the beginning of this century, we would expect to see stuff that's mostly similar to, of course, what we saw in the 13th century. So a lot of male surcoats. Because it's the beginning of the 14th century, I don't think we would expect to see many forms of plate, though we could see a coat of plates. I don't know what these goldish elements are to this guy's armour, and I'm assuming he might be Edward II, King of England. They do look to have some measure of padding underneath their male coifs, which is good. So often we see male coifs sitting on people's bare scalps, so that would not protect anyone against and even a sword strike. There's enough concussive force in there to do some serious damage to someone's head, so there was ex exceptional padding underneath these coifs and it doesn't look like there is as much padding as we see historically, where historically there was so much padding their heads actually kind of looked like round bubble kind of things with mail over top. Ooh, it's a Castle! And the castle looks look mostly okay from what we can see here. These look to be wooden or maybe slate tile shingles. That's okay. I'm not sure about those corbels. This battlement does not look extended enough off the rampart to provide us with meticulous arms. Now, of course, embattlements were extended a little bit off the line of the wall underneath for just the aesthetic look, but oftentimes they weren't extended very much. And what we see here is that there is significant corbelling holding up the edge, and so they might be able to fit a small machiculation behind, but it's hard to tell. Okay, we get a closer up view of this guy's gold kind of weird armor. What is that? That just looks like a mess. Now, I'm not saying it would have been impossible for someone really wealthy to interlink some gold rings 
beams into their mail like he has on his coif, but that shoulder thing, what is that? I know it's meant to be some type of pauldron, but I'm saying, what is it made as, like, just gold hammered down together? I don't know. Alright, so this guy has some plates intermixed with his mail, see these small little pauldrons here? That is in line with armour of the 14th century, but what we can see from this close-up is that this guy's wearing no padding under his coif. That basically offers no protection to blunt force trauma at all. Okay, another close-up. It seems to be thin, I don't know, gold-plated? Little flower kind of thing studded together? Yeah, okay. Oh, that's a big looking trebuchet, which is actually accurate to the period in which this movie was based. It wasn't that long before the events of this movie in which Warwolf was built by Edward I and was actually used against the Scots during the Scottish War for Independence, and so it's very possible that Warwolf could have still been in use. Now, as to actual historical documentation of Warwolf being used in this part of the Scottish War for Independence, not entirely sure. But Warwolf was built in 1304, which is, you know, not far before the time when Robert the Bruce returned from exile and waged his long campaign against the British. And so the size of this trebuchet actually fits the period. Well done! Okay, this looks to be the classic medieval pillaging and raping, which look, of course it happened, but the understanding that I'm starting to get from looking into the medieval period is that it wasn't nearly as this bad in every single instance. In fact, one account that I come across was when the English had besieged one of these French towns, and they went into looted, and this English soldier goes into this French woman's house and he sits down and is like, alright, get me something to eat. So the French woman gives him something to eat and is like, okay, and I'll take this, this, and that. And he like takes a, you know, a salt shaker or something else, something else, and then leaves the woman perfectly safe with most of her belongings and stuff like that. And so the idea that when a medieval army looted an entire city, they didn't take everything and burn the whole thing to the ground. Sometimes they only took two to three valuables from whatever they found and whatever they struck their face, they oh, I like that, and left most of the citizenry in peace. But of course there are other accounts when a medieval army conquered a city and slaughtered everyone inside. Just look to the First Crusade. Okay, well he's not covered in mud, he looks mildly groomed, and from what we can see of his clothing, it's not falling apart in tatters and stuff like that, and there looks to be a bit of colour. It's a boot. I don't know much about medieval boats. So it looks good to me, though I'm sure there might be many expert out there who knows many things about Shut No, that is like a Viking-style boat of the 11th century, what are you talking about? I don't know. Okay, again the clothing, yeah, he's looking a bit dirty, but this could be when is in exile and stuff like that, and so maybe he just hasn't had a bath in a while. They all look to be wearing clothing that's decently accurate to the period. Their swords, though, it's hard to tell. They don't look like they're fixed to their belts properly. Now, Matt Easton's actually done a phenomenal video with Todd from Todd's Workshop about medieval belt scabbards and how they were fixed to the belts. Brilliant video! But it's a bit hard for me to tell if these ones are done that way or not. Alright, so these guys are certainly falling into that cliche thing of medieval people being dirty, never taking baths or washing their clothing. Again, I don't know with the context of this scene, it could be that they're on, you know, the march or something like that, because he's certainly looking worse for wear as well. Oh, this armour is looking a bit interesting. It looks like it might be a coat of plates. And I mentioned before, that would fit the period of this film. And there looks to be significant padding underneath that helmet and, you know, mail hooked onto the sides. And this scene is there's a lot of movement, but that battle axe looks fairly accurate as well. Though, look, he's wearing one of those leather bracer kind of things. And that looks to be a dress kind of bracer. Not the type of ones that could actually use as some type of armour. Though, look at that thing on his back. That's a bullock dagger! And the bullock dagger was popular in Scandinavia, Flander, Wales, Scotland and England between the 13th and 8th. 18th centuries. Well, there you go, that's another very historically accurate nugget that we've seen right here. Ooh, in the back, though, is he wearing mail under that gambeson? Hard to tell. If it's just a gambeson, if an axe is sharp enough, it has a decent chance of getting through with enough force behind it. And even if it doesn't, right in the back like that with the force that we're seeing here, that would hurt! Ah, uh, ah, so this looks to be Edward II. Edward I was depicted as being the bad guy in Braveheart, Edward Longshanks died in 1307, and if this movie depicts Robert the Bruce returning to England and waging his, you know, 11 year or so war, well he returned to England in 1307, so this would have to be Edward II, and not Edward I. Unless they wanted to build off of Edward Longshank's kind of infamous reputation as a pretty brutal king, and they just wanted a better bad guy, and so they just said, it's Edward I, Longshanks or whatever, he, he'll be the guy fighting Robert the Bruce in this movie. I did wonder if that other guy was Edward II, so maybe that's 
the son, Edward II, and this is Edward I, right at the point about where he's gonna die? I don't know. Oh my goodness, fire arrows? This is such an annoying myth that Hollywood loves to keep promoting. Unless they were very specifically made, the fire would get blown out as soon as the arrow is shot. They don't work! Again, unless specifically made, and even when they are made to retain the fire once they're shot, they rarely ever set fire to things that they land in. The most stupid and egregious kind of use of, you know, the fire arrow stupidity is in the movie Timeline, where they're shooting fire arrows, and then the commander of the leader decides to do something really inventive, and he says, Night arrows. And they're just normal arrows, and they're shooting normal arrows, I think it's this big, huge, inventive thing, and no, that is just so stupid! It's hilarious that fire arrows has become so entrenched in the idea of medieval combat that normal arrows are considered something special. I mean, seriously. Because the other thing about fire arrows, if they're shot at night time, if they're actually made in the way to retain the fire, which the ones in the movies don't look to be, and it's a very expensive process and other things like that, where normal arrows are much, much more efficient, but even if they could could retain the fire once they're shot, it makes them far more visible and easier to dodge. Fire arrows! Stupid! Well, it's a castle. Looks a bit small. Is that a big window on the outside? Yeah, not so sure about this castle. That looks like a rondel dagger, which might actually be outside of the period of this film. It was used in the 14th century onwards, but this film is based in the early 14th century, and they didn't have too much of an edge on them. They were oftentimes used as an anti-armor type weapon. I'm not saying it's outside of the realm of possibility. Why aren't they using the bollock dagger that we saw before? Oh, it's a warhammer! And it's a historically accurate one as well, none of those Thor Mjolnir kind of warhammers. A historical warhammer! And look at these leather braces again. It's funny, this movie has some really positive elements, and yet there are still Still some profoundly stupid, inaccurate Hollywood tropes that it is still perpetuating. Ooh, hang on. Is that an Albion? If it's not a real Albion, it's certainly made to look exactly like one of them. I mean, yep, it's the sword known as the Laird, as sold by Albion. That is awesome, because Albion makes some of the most historically accurate, high quality and functional swords really in the world. Countless reviews of their swords give them a near flawless rating. And so seeing an Albion in a movie, that's pretty cool. Though, I believe that stylized cross is a much later period style of cross on a sword. I'm not saying it's outside of the realms of possibility, but the Scottish styled cross guards that were angled up a little bit, to my understanding, later period. And I wonder if they picked it for this movie because it's considered a Scottish style sword, but they just didn't pay attention to the time period in which this style was more prevalent. It would be more accurate to see a regular styled early 14th century medieval sword. And let us not look over the fact that he just stabbed it into the ground. That's very bad sword care right there. If you cared about your sword, you'd never do that. And from what we can see of this trailer, it seems like there are no long swords. That's not to say long swords didn't exist in this period, but they would be much more rare. Arming swords are by far the most prominent sword in this period. If this is in a castle, that wall, more often than not, should be rendered with a whitewash paint over top. But I like that they got candles in there. I don't see any wall flame torches and stuff like that. Candles are how they lit the insides of their homes in the medieval period. Not big kind of torches sitting in sconces on the wall, they don't last long enough, those things. Oh, people going through some sword forms. Is that guy holding a buckler? Because this is accurate to the time period of I-33. The earliest medieval sword system as depicted on a medieval manuscript, and it dates to the 14th century. Though there is some debate about that. Yet still, codified complex swordsmanship techniques absolutely existed in this period. Complex, sophisticated, and very effective medieval martial arts. I like the fact that there's a lot of spears around here. The spear is so often an overlooked medieval weapon. Everyone loves swords, and I love swords too! But the spear so often was the main primary weapon of so many medieval armies. A lot of bucklers there as well, which is, again, accurate to the time period. This movie, I mean, it looks to be getting a lot of things right, more so than I've seen in other movies. Let's not even start with Braveheart. I mean, they're wearing kilts, okay, at the beginning of the 14th century. Kilts! No. Not to mention William Wallace's claim or all the fact that the Battle of Stirling Bridge was fought without even a bridge in it. I mean, yeah. Alright, there's a mixture of great helms here. We've got sugarloaf great helms and the more regular flat top great helms. The great helm started to lose its prominence within the 14th century, but this being the beginning of the 14th century, it is accurate to see great helms. And the flat top ones, they would be a bit more out of date, but people did wear old armour, so I can't say it's inaccurate. This is how we do it. 
take the land back castle by castle. I like what he said there because that is how you took land back. You took the castles. This guy also looks to be wearing a coat of plates. Good stuff. And yes, these really look like coat of plates. My goodness, two big thumbs up. Though it doesn't look like it, they must be close to the shoreline here, otherwise these horses are riding on water. Okay, those houses. Ugh, yeah, look, medieval houses were small, generally one room structures, so I'm not saying it's impossible that they could have been this bad, but they would be the exception, not the norm. The average peasant's home would be a little bit bigger than this, and it looks like they just got dirt roofs here. At least thatch people, come on, and in this period we could expect to see wooden or clay shingles to be far more common. I like Chris Pine as an actor. I really have enjoyed him in the new Star Trek movies and stuff like that. Not sure if he suits this role. I'll have to wait to see the movie to make a proper call on that. But American actors are not really known well for doing good English or Scottish accents. Okay, this looks to be a big battle charge. Why are these guys on the front lines holding the flags? I'm not saying no one held flags in a medieval army. But the front line of knights? I would say no. Is this guy holding Captain America's shield? Hey, I'm not saying stars didn't appear on medieval heraldry. They just look particularly like Captain America kind of stars. Okay, this movie is looking quite promising. I'm definitely going to watch it. Just from what we've been able to see from this trailer, it's doing a far better job than many other movies based in the medieval period. Of course, when I watch it, there might be some howlers of historical and accuracy that we just can't see in this trailer but from what we see it's actually looking pretty good and if the movie is as good as what the trailer is hinting at even though there are some of those hollywood myths that's still perpetuating on the most part is looking good maybe this could be a turning point in cinematized medieval drama let's hope so so thank you for watching guys i do hope you have enjoyed and i look forward to seeing you next time until then yeah.